Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming uh, here this morning. I know there's a lot uh, going on, but uh, we appreciate your taking an interest in what's going on at the FCC. Uh, one of my priorities as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission will be process reform, and in particular, uh, making the agency's operations more transparent. I identified many ways of doing this when I served as a commissioner in the minority, and I want to deliver on some of those ideas now that I have the privilege of serving as chairman. I want this commission to be as open and uh, accessible as possible to the American people. I want us to do a better job of communicating with those that we are here to serve. Now, when a U.S. senator or representative introduces a bill, that legislation is soon thereafter made available to the general public. Before any debate begins about the bill, anyone, anywhere, can read it. That's not how things work at the FCC. The text of a document that the FCC votes on at its monthly meetings is sent to commissioners at least three weeks before the vote. But it isn't released publicly until after the vote takes place. This is precisely the opposite of transparency. Now, that's not to say that uh, the contents of FCC proposals and orders remain secret to everyone. Lobbyists with inside the Beltway connections are typically able to find out what's in them. But the best that average Americans will get is selective disclosures authorized by the chairman's office. Disclosures designed often to paint items in the most favorable light. More often, the public is kept completely in the dark. Today, we begin the process of making the FCC more open and more transparent. I'm pleased to announce this morning a pilot project that, if successful, will become a commission practice, one that I believe will give the public much more insight into the commission's activities. Specifically, at the end of my remarks, I will be releasing two documents that I've presented to my fellow commissioners for a vote at the FCC's February meeting. The first is a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPRM, that seeks comment on allowing television broadcasters to use ATSC 3.0, the next generation broadcast standard. The second is a report and order giving AM radio broadcasters more flexibility in citing their FM translators. The credit for the excellent work on these two items belongs to the superb staff of the Media Bureau and the Office of Engineering and Technology, some of whom I'm pleased to hear, uh, see here today. Now, an NPRM and a report and order are essentially the beginning and the end of a conversation that any administrative agency has with the American public about regulation. Uh, one announces a proposal and asks for public input, and the other takes stock of that input and announces a decision. Between now and our monthly meeting on February 23rd, we will closely assess how the process plays out with respect to these items. And I've deliberately chosen one NPRM and one order for purposes of this test run. Should things go well, my hope is to make it the norm to publicly release well in advance the text of all agenda items for monthly commission meetings. And my goal is a simple but powerful one, equal access to the administrative process. I would like to thank uh, Chairman Greg Walden of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Chairman Ad uh, Representative Adam Kinsinger, and Senator Dean Heller, the original sponsors of the FCC Process Reform Act. That legislation, which includes this and other common sense reforms, unanimously passed the House of Representatives last week. I also want to thank my friend and colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly, for championing this reform during his time at the Commission. And I look forward to working with him and Commissioner Clyburn in the months to come on additional ways to bring more transparency to the FCC. And with that, I will uh, turn the floor over to Commissioner O'Reilly. Well, thank you, everyone. I will be brief. I want to say this is an idea whose time has come. I applaud Chairman Pai for taking initiative to implement this important change to our procedures, and I can't wait to see all of the other process changes he has planned for the coming months. You all know I have a list of ideas if he needs any. But more seriously, uh, Chairman Pai has, Pai has been a great partner in this effort. Today is a major step forward for the agency in terms of transparency and accountability. 
while it may make our jobs a little bit more challenging, it is the right thing to do for the American public, the practitioners before the commission, and the professional staff and press who report on the commission activities. It should make your jobs a little bit easier, and you won't have to eliminate, you can eliminate some time chasing down dead ends. If this initial attempt goes well, and I see no reason why it wouldn't, I think we'll all find it to be a significant upgrade in terms of the quality of feedback, quality of process, and ultimately the quality of the Commission's work product, which is stellar to date. Soon we can make this standard operating procedure for more of the Commission's work. So I want to say kudos and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions you might have about uh, the step we are taking today. David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there were frequently edits made to items in the last minutes or hours before a vote. Uh, and I'm wondering if the public will, at, in your vision at least, at some point ever have access to that kind of edit chain and that process. Because it seems like there's a lot that happens in between the release of an item, the circulation of an item, and the vote that might be interesting to the public. Correct. At this time, we do not anticipate uh, releasing iterative uh, versions of the document that uh, we'll be releasing today. Um, but that's part of the pilot project. We want to get uh, public input on uh, on how it's going and if there are ways to improve it. And you said you just test the success of this program. How do you plan to do that? Uh, partly just by getting feedback. If uh, people uh, seem to find it useful to have uh, more transparency, and in particular, I want to make sure that my commissioners uh, uh, also have input as well. One of the things I've heard from them, including Commissioner O'Reilly, is that quite often uh, meetings that are held about uh, items like these that we're going to be voting on are sort of, sort of inchoate or disconcerted because you know, people have to come in and say, well, we have heard from certain people that what is in the item is X. Is that true? And you know, the commissioner might have to say, no, it's X plus Y or X, you know, not X. And there's this back and forth that goes on endlessly. And so we would like to hear from uh, members of the, this commission as well uh, to see how things are going. Does it make things more efficient and, and the like? And so uh, we're taking a very holistic approach, and you know, if, if things work well, then hopefully we can broaden it to include all uh, commission meeting items. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think Brian had a question. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Hi. Um, what's your time frame for assessing the success or uh, failure of this, of this uh, pilot project? Uh, that's a good question. So obviously the meeting itself is going to be on February 23rd. And uh, after the vote is taken uh, in the su subsequent days, I would anticipate that we'll take stock of uh, how things go. And hopefully if things go well, uh, you know, as I said, we'll make the decision to broaden it uh, for the March meeting. And, and how many uh, other provisions of the FCC Process Reform Act do you anticipate you might be able to implement yourself uh, without an act of Congress? Uh, that's a good question. We're actively reviewing a, a lot of process reform ideas, and we are hopeful that we'll be able to take action on those that lie within the scope of our authority. Uh, with respect to this one, I'm informed that uh, there doesn't need to be additional authority from Congress or even a rules change uh, within the Code of Federal Regulations. And so uh, my hope is that those things that we have the power to do, we can do. And for those things that uh, Congress needs to allow us to do, uh, the Congress will move with the dispatch to uh, to help us do. Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw was somebody over here. Oh. And just to make clear, so under the old rules, you were not allowed to discuss the actual text of something under review. So did you have to change the rules to allow people to to do this, or just because the fact that it's public now, you, you the commissioners can discuss it like anything else? My understanding is the latter, based on uh, the advice of general counsel, is that we have the ability to authorize the disclosure of this sort of information. I stress that this is not an official release, so it does not, for legal purposes, count as notice under the Administrative Procedure Act. But nonetheless, uh, within the rules uh, that grant the chairman authority, I do have the ability to make these documents public. And I think, Mar um, sorry, Margaret, did Yeah, I did have a question. Uh, so are these these are two items that will be on the February meeting agenda? Correct. Are there any others that will be on the agenda that you're not releasing today? And if so, why, why not release some of those others? Uh, well, stay tuned. Uh, we are going to be issuing the Sunshine Notice, as it's called, which announces the full list of uh, items that are going to be considered at the meeting uh, later on today. Uh, but with respect to these, I picked these two in particular because it is a pilot program, and so I wanted to pick one that was exemplary of you know, the start of that administrative uh, uh, process conversation, as I called it, which is the NPRM, and one that represents its conclusion, uh, the report and order. And so, uh, you know, as I said again, if things go well, then I would anticipate that a, a full panoply of items uh, will be uh, released in this manner in the future. Oh. 
Um, thanks, Your This is my minor detail, but uh, is would it always be 21 days ahead of time, as I believe was proposed in, in uh, FCC process format? Uh, correct. Uh, by FCC rule, we have to release at least three weeks before any public meeting uh, to, to our uh, colleagues here at the commission. Um, I have to circulate to them what the uh, orders are going to be or proposals that we're going to be voting on. And so I would anticipate that similarly, at least three weeks in advance of that, uh, if things go well, that we would publicize the text of these meeting uh, documents, meeting items. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, John, I think, had his hand up. Uh, sorry. He's also got a very stylish jacket on, so I've got to give him credit for that. <laughs> um, without putting too sharp a point on it, why didn't this happen long ago? I mean, this is the way, you know, all government agencies generally work. Why didn't it happen long ago? I, I'm not sure. It always struck me as odd, especially as I talk to uh, friends of mine who aren't involved in uh, the, the world of the FCC don't labor in these fields. And I would ask them, well, what, what would you think if somebody who represents you in Congress could introduce a bill, get it passed, and then only afterward tell you what it was that you know, he or she uh, was proposing? They said, well, that's crazy. And I said, well, that's exactly what happens here at the FCC. And uh, that obviously has pernicious effects, I think, on the, the public perception of our work. I mean, they think that we're going to be more insular and we won't take public input. It, but it also has the odd effect of empowering those who do have connections here at the FCC. They are the select few uh, who are able to have input. And to me, at least, it's just a very simple, small-D democratic function that if an administrative agency that is, after all, to some extent accountable to the public, is going to make decisions affecting potentially one-sixth of the economy, the very least we could do is tell them what we're going to do before we actually do it. So uh, I'm not sure. I know there have been you know, some uh, you know, other considerations that have maybe impeded this idea in the past, but uh, you know, the, again, as I said, that I have the privilege of uh, wielding the gavel here at the FCC. Uh, I want to do everything I can to make this agency more open and transparent, and that starts on you know, day nine of this administration, uh, making sure that you and anyone in the country uh, can see exactly what it is that I'm asking my commissioners uh, to vote on, my fellow commissioners. I so assuming all goes well and you start doing this for all your agenda items, um, are you thinking you might expand this to all items that you circulate when you do circulate them? And can you, can you think of any principled reason why you wouldn't put those out at the same, same time? That's a good question. We haven't yet considered uh, what uh, process uh, might be uh, taken with respect to non-meeting uh, items. Uh, I obviously consider meeting items to be more significant since that's where uh, you know, the, the agency has a legal obligation to have a public-facing uh, 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 a conversation about what it is that they're uh, voting on. So uh, we'll take that into consideration uh, going forward. But at this point, I haven't made any uh, decisions with respect to items that are on circulation. Hi, Chairman. Hi. Um, how do you think this might affect the deliberative process in the final weeks? Do you think it might make it take longer? There might be more lobbying? Well, we'll see. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why you have a pilot program is to see how things will shake out. I would hope, though, that uh, it would actually aid the deliberative process so that instead of you know, for a few weeks of people on the outside trying to figure out what's in these documents and only in the last week feverishly, uh, or last week and change, feverishly beating on our doors saying, oh my gosh, we heard something is in there, let's change it. Now you could shift a lot of that conversation more up front since, I mean, you'll get to see Everyone will get to see what's in this document the minute I hand it to you. Um, and so conversations up front will be uh, quicker and more meaningful. Um, and on the back end, I would hope that it would help uh, sharpen uh, commissioners thinking uh, about these items you know, well before, to say, 24 hours before a meeting. I mean, they'll know what everyone on the outside thinks because the outside will let them know sooner. And so my hope is anyway that working collaboratively, uh, you know, we can reach a decision that uh, it doesn't stretch into the wee hours of the night, the night before the meeting, or even the morning of. But again, that's to be determined. We'll see. Okay. Oh, thanks, by the way, for your tweet about bacon. I really appreciated that. So. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, sure. Well, I don't want to get into too much detail about the item before folks have a chance to, to read it, but what I will say is that um, I think the FCC should enable innovation in the broadcasting business just as it should in any other sector of the communications industry. And I think ATSC 3.0, or Next Gen TV as some have called it, uh, offers significant potential uh, to carry broadcasting into the, into the Internet protocol age in a way that I think most consumers would find tremendously beneficial. And it's not just a question of you know, 4K uh, transmissions or being able to view uh, the programming on your you know, mobile device. It's also the public safety function, for example, allowing more localized information that would allow uh, broadcasters to target uh, you know, emergency information to people uh, based on uh, more closely on where they live and that sort of thing. And that's, um, I think, ultimately, uh, there are many, many benefits to ATSC 3.0 that I hope, hopefully my colleagues will uh, see fit to authorize uh, in, the com in the coming weeks. Thanks. And I think Lynn is, oh, sorry, Lynn is in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the tentative agenda. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Someone at the FCC should know that, I guess. <laughs> uh, Margaret? Yeah, I have another question. Okay. You know, and I mean, you may have said this. Is this the first time that the commission has done this? Really? To my knowledge, that is, uh, that is correct. Dave? This is sort of a more philosophical question for you, but these documents are highly technical, highly legal. How would you say to members of the public? Well, first, I would speak well of their sanity. But second of all, uh, what I would say is that I picked these two docu documents in particular, um, not just because I think they hold a sp special promise in terms of benefiting the consumer, uh, cons benefiting consumer welfare, but also because uh, the staff who are arrayed behind you just did a fantastic job presenting quite often complex concepts and uh, uh, technical details in a way that's highly readable. I mean, I personally read each word of each of these documents. I found it very accessible. Now, granted, I'm sort of in the belly of the beast, but nonetheless, I think it explains in a very cogent way to the lay reader why this is important. You know, why does it matter to revitalize AM radio by allowing translators to help AM broadcasters build a bridge to the future? Why does it matter to have this next generation transmission standard that will allow uh, viewers to benefit from you know, better services and uh, more information. I think the staff did a, just a superb job of explaining that in a way that I hope anyway uh, will be eminently readable. And so the credit for that you know, deserves to them. I was just uh, uh, a reader who was happy to see that it was described in such accessible terms. Is that priority for you in your chairmanship to, to make the work of the commission uh, more accessible, not just in, in fact, but in that's my hope anyway. I mean, you, as you probably have seen over the last several years in my own separate statements, uh, whether in dissent or in approving, I mean, my goal is to try to explain uh, to the outside world that might not have uh, a lot of experience in you know, the world of the FCC exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, you know, what the technology involved is. Uh, and I think it's important because I don't want us to become an agency that is you know, very focused on the, the acronyms and the, you know, the just the technical details that other people might not know about. Uh, our work affects every American in one way or the other, and I want every American to be able to pick up, ideally, an FCC document and be able to say, you know what, I understand what the FCC is doing here. I agree with it or disagree with it, but at least I understand it. And I just think that's honestly one of the, the characters, uh, aspects of public service I think is important, explaining to the people you're governing how it is you're governing and why you're doing it. Not to get all schmaltzy, but I think it's important. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, everyone, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing these with you.